Well, good morning, everybody. I'm glad that you're here. We are really informal this morning. Um, I'm Michelle Erpenbach from the Central District, of, uh, and I serve on the Sioux Falls City Council. I was elected a couple of years ago in 2010, and I just am appreciative of the voters in my district. And, and uh, as I was saying earlier, Cheryl Rath, who's here with us today, had suggested, and a couple of other people as well have said, you know, it's a good thing for city council members to just uh, spend some time one-on-one -on -one with uh, members of their district, with voters and people, citizens with concerns. And so that's what this is about this morning, very informal. And uh, we'll just kind of pass the microphone around because we are on city link this morning. But um, just as uh, whatever's on our minds this morning, let's, let's talk about different issues. The, you know, there are some concerns in the central district, obviously, and there are some joys with living in the central district. And so... I just invite you to, to uh, whatever it is that's on your mind. And I know that you have a question, so if you want to grab that microphone, let's start with that. Yeah, I was just uh, wondering how the city was involved with the Blood Run project of the new park. You know, I, I did, I was talking earlier about the handouts, that I, not really handouts, but some of the materials that I brought this morning. I wanted to give you a flavor for um, the things, the broad range of materials and, and information that City Council works with. And Blood Run is one of those um, topics that is very important to the state, obviously. But um, we, several of us were in Pier a couple of weeks ago for Sioux Falls Day at the legislature. And the luncheon then during that time was all about Blood Run. And the, and the governor, Governor Dugard, announced that a uh, foundation has been created and that they have begun raising money toward the uh, development of that park. The city is sort of involved in an indirect way. Um, we haven't at this point put any money toward Blood Run, but it would be something that may be, may be something that we want to make an investment in. Um, our development foundation and uh, folks like that are more involved with it. And um, I think their goal right now is a couple of million dollars, and I'm gonna, there's lots of numbers always running around in my head, but it's a couple million dollars to get those first phases done on the Blood Run Park. And the thing that's going to be most important for us is, and they keep saying, this is going to be like Custer State Park on the east side of, of, of South Dakota. And I have to, as a Black Hills native, kind of disagree with the size and the scope and all of that. But it's a beautiful area, virtually untouched, and really historic in terms of you know, the, the Native American artifacts that are there. And at one point, it was you know, a, a, basically an urban mecca for you know, the Native Americans in this area. It was a trading center. There are all kinds of really historic things there. And so it'll be an exciting thing to have here. And the other piece of it for us then is that it's really close to that casino that's on the Iowa side of the line. And so it's one more sort of gateway to Sioux Falls type uh, development things. And so it'll be something that you will see um, in terms of, you aren't gonna necessarily see it in the Sioux Falls city budget but you're going to see it as being something that, that we're active in encouraging uh, people to, to contribute to it. We're going to be active in um, you know, having a say in that development in, in terms of what's it going to look like, um, how is it going to play into our, our economy. You know, it's, within, it's a stone's throw from, city, from the city um, limits, so it's, it's really close. a joint venture with, Iowa, with the state of Iowa. Oh, it, is. Yeah. It, it crosses the state line. Oh, I'm sorry. It's a joint venture with the state of Iowa because it crosses the state line. Um, and the presentations that they've given so far, it is a fascinating project. Um, it is, and Cheryl's right, it's that, it's one of those, you know, we always throw out these partnership ideas, but it is one of those projects that's going to be amazing to see two different governments work together. And then how do we manage that? Yeah, that's, that is kind of laughable, isn't it? How do you make two governments work together? <laughs> Yeah, exactly. So it's going to be exciting. It'll be exciting for us to have that this close. So. Yeah, that's a, it's a mm -hmm. good project. Yeah, it's going to be a great project. Is it, is the historical this, it, it, you're, you're a member of the historical board? And, the um, or the Land Heritage Museum yeah, Board. Is, mm -hmm. is there any involvement with them? You know, I bet there will be. Um, we haven't, as a board, talked about that yet, the relationship between the museum and Blood Run. Um, we see the, the Siouxland Heritage Museums are working a lot with, um, like, the River Greenway downtown at Sioux Falls, doing a lot of the historic research, and, and uh, with the Mary Joan Wagner um, Arboretum as well. They've done a lot of those things. So I would imagine that absolutely Blood Run would be, in, would be one of those projects that those museums would be involved with. So, yeah, that's, that's a great connection. It really is. Other, yeah. 
Um, it was just announced that uh, the city has signed an agreement with South Dakota Department of Transportation to study the 26th Street uh, corridor from Cliff Avenue to Southeastern. And I wonder if you have information on that or? You know, right now I don't have details on that, Cheryl, but you know that you and I both live fairly close to that area. And that, that 26th Street, just even, you know, from 26th Street all the way from Minnesota all the way out to, you know, almost a sycamore, it's a mess. If you're driving to work, it's a horrible experience, you know. I do everything that I can to, to avoid that. And I think that's part of what we're going to look at is that idea of how do we make that better for folks. Um, it kind of kind of dovetails into that whole idea, and I know that we'll talk about the railroad relocation this morning as well, but you talk about that railroad crossing at 26th and Southeastern. We're going to have to think, you know, as leaders, as a community, we're going to have to think more created, creatively about how do we manage that? You know, do we need to, you know, the Burlington Northern really wants us to get away from, and I do too for a lot of reasons, that get away from those at-grade crossings so that, that cars don't have to stop, cars don't have to pay attention to that train, they can just drive you know, over the bridge. And you've seen that in a lot of locations, there are a lot of places, 57th Street, 69th, where um, we're building those crossings like that. I, I would assume that that's gonna be part of that study is how do we make that railroad crossing better because that affects traffic for literally miles on 26th Street. Um. My concern, uh, and as you stated, we both live in that area, is that 26th Street is very narrow from Frederick Drive to Cliff Avenue. Uh, it's a, basically a two-lane road, mm -hmm. and there are homes all along there. There's an elementary school. There's four or five businesses between Cliff Avenue and Southeastern. Uh, all of those will be impacted if it means widening, uh, right. especially that one section. Right, exactly. Um, if you look at those, those front yards aren't mm -hmm. very big, mm -hmm. and most of those don't even have, uh, you know, have the parking. They don't yes. have that boulevard between. Mm -hmm. So they're right, their sidewalks are right on the street now. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. It's going to be an area of huge impact. Yeah. We're going to decide to widen 26th mm -hmm. Street there. Mm -hmm. So that's where, for me as a, as a leader and as, as folks who are involved with the Central District, we're going to have to be pretty active in that process. Yes. I think that, because right. um, I was just driving by there the other day and I was looking at people's front doors and going, I'm almost driving in their front yard yes. on 26th Street, mm -hmm. you know? So it's yeah. just tight. So there's, yeah. there's... Well, and I question too whether it's also going to involve uh, the exit off of I-229, uh, if that's going to be re redesigned too, because I live in the Riverdale area, and those homes back right up against 26th Street. So there's, I mean, that's their backyard uh, is where that exit is. Um, also, um, you know, the at-grade crossings are of a lot of interest right now uh, for Burlington Northern. And one of the proposals that came out this week uh, was using the dual track uh, that runs down to River Boulevard uh, as one of the alternatives. But it would block uh, River Boulevard and Cliff Avenue. And everybody knows where those dual tracks are down by Buck's Muffler. Um, and the suggestion was made that um, to resolve that, they would use electronic signs directing people through surrounding neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, when I heard that, I thought it was totally ridiculous mm -hmm. uh, because anybody who travels Cliff Avenue understands the volume of traffic on that road. It's a major north-south route. Mm -hmm. um, but that is one of the alternatives that was thrown out. Yep, exactly. And, and, um you know, the conversation is, and kind of to bring folks up to speed, part of that railroad relocation conversation is that, um, that there, is, there, there is the need to turn trains around that are coming from Madison and need to go to, to the east to Minnesota. And one of the things that they need to do is to, for safety's sake, pull the train off to the side, take the locomotive off the front of it here and move it around to the back of it so it can pull it out and go to Minnesota. So there's always a locomotive on the front of the train. It's a safety issue 
and it's you know it's one of those policies that you know I, I get it you know it makes sense but the issue then is how long does it take for that to happen and very often it's my understanding that when that train is being switched like that that locomotive is being switched very often they're also switching their staff for that train and very often that train will sit for a number of hours up to 24 hours so there's some real issues with that the, the exciting thing, though, about that potential use of those double tracks, you know, down by, by uh, Mr. Bendo, you know, Buck's Mufflers down there, that, the exciting thing about that is that it keeps it out of our neighbors' backyards in southeast South the Sioux Falls who are concerned that they don't need extra tracks, they didn't, didn't buy into this deal. But the exciting thing is that there are parts there that we wouldn't, we, there wouldn't be necessarily rebuilding anything. We wouldn't build things new. It would be less expensive. But it does create that issue of stopping on Cliff Avenue and River Boulevard. I hadn't even thought about how far down that stretch is. The Cliff Avenue one, I can kind of see. Because you can, if, if you work with those signs, you could send people, if you're coming, you know, coming, north, coming from the north and, and you're, you hit 10th Street and you see, oh, it's blocked, there's a sign that says it's blocked, I'm going to hit, I'm going to go around on 10th or whatever, I can see that happening. But if I'm down there already, I'm headed into your neighborhood or I'm headed into the park, you know, where the speed limits are different. And again, I mean, I don't know the traffic numbers there, but you don't have to be a rocket science to, scientist to know. There's lots and lots, of, hundreds and hundreds. Well, you're headed north into yeah. in the industrial park area. Right, exactly. Which thousands of people are. Yeah, exactly. They're coming from, from south of 14th, trying to get, you know, to Morales or up to Citibank or wherever. Yeah, absolutely. We're talking huge numbers of cars there. I don't think it's a feasible alternative. It, it may not be, but for me, it was one of those things where we're looking at so many. We've looked at a few different options, and I know that they've studied you know, dozens of ideas. And this one was a brand new idea this week. It was, this was the first I had heard of it. Yeah. And so for me, that's, that's important, that we are looking at other things. I think that, that this... Moving that switchyard out of out of downtown is it has some dramatic economic development possibilities, but um, we're going to have to keep looking at, at those. At what cost? Um, you know, moving it out of downtown at what cost? Right, right, exactly. Um, yep. And I think um, I think the other piece of that then we talk about what cost it is, but it's also then what's the payback? For me, if we talk about you know it, I've heard it's if we took that switchyard and moved it somewhere else wherever I'm you know we'll debate that forever but we move that switchyard out of downtown will open up between 13 and 16 acres of land that can be developed and that I've been told by development folks that's about the size of two of those CNA buildings if you look at that CNA building now that it's getting you know it's got windows and everything it's a real thing you think about two more of those downtown the amount of property tax income the amount of jobs that are involved with that to me, the payback is, is pretty big and really fast if we were to open up that development downtown. So to me, that's an investment that we need to be pretty serious about making because of the payback. You know, um, it's long term and it's, it's really healthy for our downtown, for the central district especially. Um, but I think you're right that we have to, again, you're, you're one of those really great examples of how, we, how citizens just have to be involved. I mean, there's some things that Cheryl will talk about that I have no clue what she's talking about. She's done so much research on it. But those are the kinds of things that are so important for us as citizens to be involved with. I and think that was actually demonstrated this week, though. Mm -hmm. When you have two meetings where over 500 people show up, mm -hmm. um, and many more were at home watching it, uh, well, that wasn't available on Channel 16 at that time. Right. But it is, um, the question and answer at the Orpheum mm -hmm. uh, is available now on Channel 16. But, I mean, you can believe that there were many more than 500. Okay. I've never seen that many people show up for a public meeting. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And I go to a lot of meetings. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so I think there is... And there was a lot of opposition expressed. I think there is tremendous pushback on this project. And that is because of the alternatives for reconfiguring uh, the rail lines, which would mean a second bridge over the falls, or a rail siding in southeastern Sioux Falls, or now possibly 14th and Cliff. Yeah, exactly. 
um, and also the folks from Brandon, mm -hmm. uh, the impacts on them. Yeah. So I think this is a discussion that's going to um, continue for quite a while. Yeah, absolutely. You know, one of the things that's been really interesting to me to learn, because I'm getting, in addition to those 500 people that were at, at meetings, we're getting tons, as city council members, tons of email. And I know the mayor is getting a ton of email on it, too. But what we have learned is that, you know, this project started as an idea from Sioux Falls, that we need to move these, these, the switching yard downtown, and, and it will make great sense for economic development. And at the time, the goal was to put the event center there. That was the reason for moving the switch yard in part, you know, in addition to safety and all those issues. But it was a massive economic development boost that was going to happen there. And it, it, over time, because prior to city council, I was also, I was in on the park board for almost five years. We were talking about that at, almost at the beginning of my term on the park board, 2005, 2006. They had been talking about moving that switch yard for years and years and years. And what I've learned then as a city council member is I've got almost nothing to say about it. It's going to come down to what the EPA decides. You know, what's the, the, or the, um, the environmental impact? And what are the citizens saying? They are less likely, the EPA is less likely to listen to elected officials than they are to listen to citizens. And so those 500 folks that are at those meetings and those people that are writing emails, every one of them, I'm telling them, Make sure that you are making contact with, you know, jump on that website that's it's SiouxFalls.org slash railroad. Jump on there and put your input into it because it makes a huge difference coming from the people who are going to be directly impacted by it. You know, and I think that's, that's the most fun about local government is that we get to do that kind of stuff. You know, that we really, this is, this is the day-to-day -day world. This is your government really in action. And these are the opportunities that we have as citizens to say, hey, you know what, that stinks and I don't want it. You know, it's not going to work that way. Think of something else or don't do it at all. You know, and so, yeah, I, that's, my, that's my big message for folks lately is, has there been. Is no, yep. There is a no-build option. Yes, there absolutely um, is. I mean, yep. at the mayor's press conference, he, says, he, he said he did not support that, but right. it, the option is still there. Right, absolutely. And, and that's always been an option that, and, you know, the other piece of it that comes into it is, is that it's federal, t uh, federal highway dollars that we're talking about, and it was an earmark that was set aside about five years ago. Earmarks, you know, if you pay attention to, to uh, federal news at all, earmarks are out of here. And we haven't used that money, and so it's very likely, you know, there's a good chance that we're having this debate just to entertain ourselves, because that money may not be there. You know, and as a city council member, I would, I would be pretty seriously considering if we had that money, if we had the federal money, and it's going to cost us some more, maybe even twice that, to actually accomplish this in a way that is palatable for most people, in a way that works for downtown, I think we would be willing to make that investment with, with local tax dollars because we know what the payoff is. But I don't think we're going to have that option because I know we aren't going to do it 100% on local tax dollars. There's no way. We have to have those federal dollars. And those federal dollars may be going away. I think we have to be really realistic about that. My other, con another concern I have in this is, is the, the sort of fear that I heard. I, I was at the Monday night meeting with um, the folks from Sioux Falls when, it, when they were talking about the railroad relocation. The fear in people's minds and in their hearts when it comes to, you know what, you're talking about putting rail, rail tracks in my backyard and then building a 20-foot wall. Is that supposed to make me feel good as a citizen? You know, and you could hear it in their voices that I'm afraid of this. And that's where, where my, my biggest concerns are with local government is we should not be setting our citizens up to be fearful. We need to be really realistic about what are the chances of that happening out there. What are the chances of us having that money stay? And what are the chances of doing something else with it, you know? Well, and where I got involved was when the Park Board voted to approve the second bridge over the falls. Uh, taxpayers have invested millions of dollars in rehabilitating that park. And to put a second bridge to the north of where the current bridge is and leave the original bridge, um, it would destroy the park. Oh, absolutely. And you know full well, I was on the Park Board then and I voted for that bridge. Now you know the difference, that it, the, the thing I learned about that bridge now? I could kick myself for voting for that because I will not support it in any way. 
It's for one train a week. That is no lie. One train a week, and sometimes not even that many. For, because it's that whole, again, the Madison, if you think about where that, it's kind of a Y shape. Coming from Madison, they need to go to Minnesota. They got to get across that somehow. The way they do it now is they come into downtown and they back it around and they park it and they move it and they, you know, they, you're sitting there waiting, trying to get to work and they're backing it back and forth. That one train a week is doing it just to make that switch. So that bridge is not effective. It, you're exactly right, it destroys the park. And it's not, the benefit is not there. I mean, you look at return on investment, there's none there. That's ridiculous. And you're not going to see support for that. I was always interested in why it was never brought up to do it out in the country somewhere. It's always been, Brandon, it was, you know, Brandon's been the city but since the beginning. You have to think about the lines, you know, where the rail lines are now. But they come um, through the country. They come through the country right, on exactly. both sides of yep. all and cities. And yeah. Uh, and had to take it off the table because it's too expensive. Well, it's, it's expensive, and, you know, in terms of, of an environmental impact, when you're building brand new rail lines someplace new, the environmental thing is huge, and it takes years and years and years again to, to do that setting. But absolutely, nobody wants it in their backyard. Let's put it out in somebody's field somewhere. That's a great idea. You know, Councilor Rolfing brought up the other day the idea of why don't we just make that cut across, make it follow I-90, you know, come off that Madison subdivision and go east on, along I-90 and hook up with that Corson line. Absolutely makes perfect sense. It's all brand new ground. So it's brand new environmental, you know, it's brand new talks about the Topeka Shiner and whoever, whatever other bizarre little animals might be involved. All of that starts all over again. And so that's the, it sends us way out of the park in terms of, of Money, finances. We've already ruined the environment in the city, so that we don't have to worry about it. Pretty much, right. yeah, exactly. He's, he's commenting that we've already ruined the city environment. That's exactly right. And, and something that we've learned over time is that we're way better, we're way nicer to the earth now than, than uh, you know, we look at the amount of contamination in the soil downtown. You know, even with the new river ramp project, when that ramp comes down, the contamination underneath that ramp, you know, in terms of the... What was it? A coal gasification plant that was in that area. You know, the soil there is just nasty, and we're going to, you know, remediate that. But yeah, it's way easier to go in and and make something better than to go in and dig up new stuff. That's another question on that parking ramp. Uh, the Lloyd Properties got it for a dollar. Who's responsible for the environmental cleanup? Is it going to be Lloyd Properties? Yep. Mm -hmm. yep. yep. The city. That was a big question for me too. When it comes to that river river ramp um, redevelopment, because um, they they got it for it's a sweet deal for them, obviously. But um, if we had sold it, or if we had done it ourselves as the city, our costs would have been between three quarters and, uh, of a million and a million dollars to take it down and do that remediation, and probably more than that once you get it out of there and you find out what's really under there. Um, so that's their deal. Um, they're going to get a little piece of that land for the, the trade-out of they're tearing it down for us and they're doing the remediation of the soil. So yeah, it looks like a really sweet deal for them. It's really a sweet deal for the city of Sioux Falls. It's the mess we would have been into in terms of doing that demolition and doing that remediation would have been just, oh, I just, yeah, <laughs> Gary's shaking his head. It just makes me sick to think about, oh my gosh, what are they getting? I'm, I'm very thankful. Thanks so much for doing it, guys, <laughs> but I'm really glad we're not doing it. I don't want to disagree with you, Michelle, but my understanding was that uh, they are going to demolish the ramp and do all of the cleanup in exchange for the taxpayers paying for the remediation of the soil on the East Bank. Now, that was my understanding. I may be wrong. Um, I don't think so. I, I, and and I, I, don't, I hate to, when we're especially going on, on Channel 16, uh, to... Uh, to uh, not put out accurate information, but it's my understanding that city isn't really going to be involved in, in that part of it. Um, we are, you know, giving them a pretty valuable piece of land in um, place of that. But there are, you know, and they are getting tax increment financing, which is, you know, one of those um, one of those uh, issues that are sort of an incentive that can be disagreeable for some folks. You know, they'll they'll pay the same property taxes on that piece of ground that they would if it were bare. 
for about 15 or 20 years and use that increment then, the difference between that very low property value and the much higher ones it's built on, they'll use that increment to help pay back some of those of that remediation issue, the, the um, expenses that are involved with the developing that land. And it's one of those, it, I like that, that incentive as um, a way to uh, encourage folks to develop downtown and other places that are a little iffy when it comes to environmental and those kinds of things. Other questions, thoughts, comments? Yeah, Jesse. Thanks, Michelle. Um, so talking about redeveloping downtown, do you know of any projects that are kind of coming up around the curve or um, any new information on the Arches project here on, I think it's 4th or 5th Street in, in Phillips? Mm -hmm. um, and I know with the river ramp, there's going to be a new hotel or something going in mm -hmm. East Bank. Just generally, yeah. any yeah. cool projects coming up downtown? You know, there's a lot of great stuff going on downtown. It's really, it's fun to live in this area because we're so close to those kinds of things. But you're right, when that river ramp comes out, what's um, the intention there is it's Lloyd Properties and, and Hague Companies that have gone together, the, the corporation that's doing that project. has um, They've put their money down, you know, made a, an agreement with Hilton Garden in, and um, that's the project that will go in. You know, if you look at, you look at that river ramp and you look at the old Shoneman's building, the, the white lumber yard, that will be the location of that Hilton Garden Inn. It'll be right next to that new CNA building so that that, that, uh, that side of the river starts to really take on an urban look to it. Um, and then if you move you know, farther north, um, you talk about the arches and uh, the uptown, uptown at the Falls development gradually coming back online. Um, we're starting to hear, and I, I don't have insider information. It's interesting. I sometimes feel like council's kind of the last to know on some of these things. but. Um, um, they, the, actually, the Good Samaritan Society, which is where I work full time, has just purchased land in that area, the uptown at, at Falls Park um, area. They will be again pursuing that idea of affordable housing for seniors um, 55 or 60 and over. Um, again, that for, affordable housing, putting it into a, you know, a demographic where it'll be based on income, um, but it's a, you know, a, a nicer kind of upscale sort of development. But they're looking for um, tax credit financing for that, and that project has struggled during the, as the um, economy kind of went down, that project really struggled. And the rest of that uptown, the Arches buildings and all of that has really struggled in the economic downturn. I don't see it going away. I think that we are going to see it happen eventually, just on a slower timetable than what, what they originally, you know, when we were first seeing that in 2007, 2008, how excited they were and how fast it was going to roll. And, we're going to be, you know, going to movies downtown really fast. And that didn't come to fruition. So many things that in that, in those economic times, kind of everybody kind of put things on hold. But I think we are definitely going to see that process, you know, um, moving forward. One of the things that I've sort of kept my eye on that's related to that is um, a proposed parking lot that, you know, the old, um, at 6th and Phillips, that little, the little, uh, it's now the park office, but used to be the Raven. Raven had their training headquarters there. To the north of that, in, in that new Falls Park West, they're looking at uh, building a parking lot in that area that would then help service the, uh, the uptown project and eventually be an access point into whatever the Sioux Steel project property eventually becomes. So there's some of that you're going to start seeing fairly soon, I think. I don't know if it's not in the in this CIP right now, but in that capital improvement plan, but it is coming down the pike. So you'll start to see we're going to do that infrastructure so that the, the uptown at Falls can, can start to progress in the way that, that they want it to. So, yeah, lots of really cool stuff coming. You know, I, I wish, in, in my heart of hearts, I wish that switching yard was gone because then we could talk pretty seriously about some major employers, you know, moving into to downtown. You know, it's amazing that Raven Industry has decided to stay you know, they could have abandoned that building and taken their headquarters. And they, they have told us. They have looked in other places. They, you know, really have chosen to stay in Sioux Falls. They're a major employer. They're going to have, you know, all their office people downtown. This is their international headquarters. How cool is that, that they're staying? So we need to build on that, you know, that idea that these folks are staying. They're going to need some parking. We're going to need to deal with some issues there. Um, so how do we, again, I, I keep dreaming that when that switch yard is gone, what do we do? 
you know, what are the cool things that we can do? And that would be one of them is let's, let's deal with more employers down there. Let's deal with better parking and entertainment options, those kinds of things. So. Is, that, is Falls Park West? Is Falls Park West strictly a financing issue, or are there also environmental issues and bedrock issues? Yeah. Uh, Pitts Salvage Yard was there. Yeah. Um, well, you know, it's the EPA brownfield thing. Just hang on to it or whatever. Um, it's a brownfield, which means that, you know, they went in and did the um, environmental remediation and then capped it with clean soil. So, I mean, if you dig into it very far, we have to be really careful what we build there. I mean, we've done some dreaming sessions, sessions where it's like, well, what if we built, you know, an amphitheater or whatever there? We have to think pretty seriously about what you're doing if you're digging into a brownfield. Um, so a parking lot is something that's okay because that's one of the questions I asked on Park Board is we're talking about putting a parking lot on top of a, of a brownfield. What does that mean? And that's one of those things that's more okay than, than maybe building, you wouldn't buy, build a sky ri uh, high rise apartments there or something. Um, but in terms of what, you know, uh, how quickly that area develops, part of it is that it's become kind of a festival grounds. You know, I kind of hesitate to take away green space and just put things in. I have heard some other options about um, possibly a more of a sculpture garden in that area, which could be really cool and, you know, add to the ambiance there. But I really like going down there for Har Hot Harley Nights, too, you know, and the German Fest and the different things that are happening along there. It's a great sort of festival ground. So it'd be, you know, because I'm not on the park board anymore, I haven't seen that master plan for that area for a while, but I have been in conversations where we're doing some dreaming and there are things that are going to happen there, but it's going to have to work around, again, that parking lot that's going to, going to come in there. But I think there are going to be some benefits to that as well. So, Other questions, comments? I have a couple of easier ones. Oh, good. Good. I have a couple of easier ones. Uh, across from McKinnon at 21st Street and Cliff Avenue, they have a request to rezone. Are you in the loop on that? Oh, it's coming up Wednesday. Oh, see, and I, yeah, I tend to ignore planning. And it's I, where they had their garden. Uh, they right. had a garden competition yeah. for their employees. Or yeah. You're, you're not familiar with. You know, and that kind of goes to our urban ag thing, that, that illegal community garden there. Yeah. <laughs> illegal. <laughs> yeah. It is. It, you know, and, and some of you know my history with community gardens in Sioux Falls. All those gardens that we've built, you know, we've put them in parks, and we've got one at Active, Active Generations that's out on a vacant lot. They're all against ordinance. We didn't know it, you know. Um, I don't know. I, I did know they had um, asked for zoning change there, but I don't know what the plan is there. And um, I guess we'll have to wait and see what, you know, by the time this is on the air, it'll be planning commission will have made its decision. Okay. So. Um, another question is that South Dakota Junior Football is moving out of Riverdale Park. And are you aware of what plans... As far as I know, uh, are for what they're going to use that for because they have the playing fields. Right, exactly. It would be my hope, and I don't know what the exact plan is, and I would imagine it's, again, one of those things that we're kind of thinking, what are we going to do? It would be my hope that the playing fields stay there. I mean, part of the reason that, you know, Riverdale Park has just been filled with South Dakota junior football. They've, they've had to turn teams away because that park is too small, and that's why we have built that new um, junior football fields up um, in that uh, Benson Road area, up just off the airport to the east or the west of the airport, it's it's just a really busy program. It's a great opportunity for young kids, but I would hate to see those playing fields go away, especially for our neighborhood, you know, Central District, because of that demand for. I mean, we just need practice fields, you know, not only not just for football, but soccer or rugby. And there's a rugby team that's been playing at Edison, you know. There's well, no options. Well, the for concern um, that the immediate neighborhood has is alcohol is allowed in that park. And uh, so far, with junior football there, it's been a family-oriented mm -hmm. activity. We do not want something like adult rugby in that park. Right. Um, and we will resist that if that happens. And the plans seem kind of uh, murky for what, what's going to happen with that when junior football leaves. So. And I would agree with that. I didn't, you know, um, 
alcohol is allowed only in certain parks in Sioux Falls, and that's interesting that it's allowed there. That would be one that I would... I believe that there are only two parks where it's not allowed. I may be wrong on that. I know McKinnon is one of them. McKinnon's one of... I think Veterans Park is the other one. Okay. Um, so we don't want to not have... We want it to be a family... Yeah. Continue to be a family well, no, oriented exactly. I mean, you, activity. Exactly. And you think about the layout of Riverdale Park. It is just it's people's backyards. You know. So yeah, absolutely. This is one I'm putting on my list. That'll be because um, that that's one of those things that we've got to be really careful with when we're talking about you know neighborhoods. Um, it's it's different when you're talking about a regional park. You know where maybe folks are using it for um, family reunions or large events or whatever. Um, I, I think of like Sertoma Park or you know even um, Terrace Park. Those parks, it, that's different. But when it's a little, you know, it's, Riverdale's, it, there's a lot of playing fields there, but it's not a very big park. It really is a neighborhood park. Let's be really careful about what we allow to happen there. That's one that I absolutely will follow up on. That that's that will be an issue for us from Central District. Absolutely. Yep. You know. The uh, site of the old Lincoln grade school up on 9th Street, uh, there's some plans in the near future for some type of development in that area? That's still owned by the school district. Yep, it is. And here's, I do actually know something about that. Hallelujah. Um, community garden, yeah, it is going to be a community garden, though. Um, the uh, southeast corner of it will be developed the first um, uh, plots will be in actually this year in 2012. There will be about 20 plots there, and it'll have water. And uh, it's it's kind of a cooperative thing between the school district and the city. The school district isn't willing to give that up yet, and and they may never. Um, they're real. They've got some concerns about. And again, I'm kind of spinning on things that I know. But um, Hawthorne Elementary um, has some issues, and you know when we talk about population, there may be a need for you know, school development there, and, and they really don't want to, they don't want to take that card off the table yet. So it's been a, an agreement between the city and the school district and the Minnehaha County Master Gardeners, and they are actually going to build that community garden there, and there may eventually be some greenhouses and those sorts of things. And a couple neighborhood meetings up there, people are pretty excited. There's some people across the street that are going to, to uh, you know, be watching out for it and, and doing that kind of stuff. So it's a, it's a cool opportunity, again, to use some land that, you know, I'd like to see a playground there. I'd like to see, you know, it's some of the very, there's very limited green space in that Pettigrew Heights area. I'd like to see some use of that green space, you know, rather than, I mean, it's great as a playing field, and it's going to be great as a garden, but what are some other things we can use that green space for? So that'll be a, a neat opportunity for us. So. The, the old uh, schoolhouse, what's the school that kids went to? Emerson. Emerson, the, the, did the city buy that from the, is that how that got turned into a park? Because the city bought That's it from right. the school district? Gary probably knows right. better than I do. They did. And the cool thing about that was. You know, hold up the microphone. Yeah, you know, once the, the city took that over, they had that granite retaining wall. Going from the upper to the lower, and that, that was maintained in the mix. Yeah. But you're right there. It's a really cool park. It really yeah, it is. Is. yeah, it is nice. And then they, there, there was kind of a deal there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Other comments, questions? Have you heard anything lately, Michelle, about uh, for sure whether the city's going to maybe get involved with the uh, Joe Fall School? That's a really good question. Because I've heard, you know, where there's obviously a need. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I heard where the city may buy that mm -hmm. and yeah. remodel it to a community center, mm -hmm. yeah. that Whittier area. Yeah. And it's one of those, you know, again, we, we look at um, the Bowdoin Center, which was, is a former school. Um, Volunteers of America runs that as a youth center. And um, we were looking, uh, Councilor Kenny Anderson has been very involved with that, that the Joe Foss School sits just inside that Northeast District. Um, but because it involves neighborhoods that I serve in the Central District, he and I have been working on that together to a certain extent. Um, one of the things that he did early on was we just we got the realtor and a couple of folks together, you know, and took some of our we took the fire um, fire inspector, we took you know the building inspector, those kinds of folks, and went in and just walked that building. And um, it's certainly an option, you know. We walked it again then with the folks from Volunteers of America. They're kind of interested. There are lots of different 
things that could happen there. It's a huge building in terms of, if, I mean, it's a small elementary school, but in terms of if you're going to use it for community stuff, it's huge. There's all kinds of things, but there's about three different eras represented in the architecture. And then they, when they built this one, they built it here, and then they built this one here, so you go down some steps to get to this one. And then this one, the third building is over here, so you go back up the steps here, and there's an elevator that goes halfway here and then halfway here, and it's the funkiest building. When you get in there and walk around, it's, it's really cool, but it's really funky when you talk about things like security. You talk about, you know, we've talked about asbestos. We think the asbestos is cleared out. But then how do you, how do you, do you split it up? I mean, we've talked about, um, you know, perhaps some, some um, affordable apartments for young folks who are, you know, would otherwise be homeless. There's a program through the Volunteers of America for that. You know, are there, what, are, what other things could happen there? And the gym is not full size, but it's got this beautiful wood floor, which, you know, all the dancers and basketball players and all that just love those wood floors, but it's really small and there's no seating and there's this funky balcony thing. And there's some really amazing things there, but how do we make that work? And the school district's price tag on it is pretty high yet, you know. Um, they aren't going to leave it for another year, and so they aren't really, don't seem to be in a big hurry to sell it. Um, so I don't know at this point. It's one of those things, the Whittier neighborhood has walked through it as well. They're, they have a really uh, you know, active resident association. They have walked through it and kind of gone, yeah, lots of opportunities here. But would we be better served to tear it down, start new? You know, we know that there are things that need to happen in that neighborhood. You know, the Salvation Army is not going to do the warming house forever. Do we need to deal, you know, provide some sort of services that way? You know, there's all kinds of, it's one of those things where, again, you know, city government, it's all about, okay, I've got this idea, you've got that idea, what, how can we make that work? And that's really where that Joe Foss School is now. It's in that sort of dreaming situation where it, in the next, you know, we're going to start in terms of, um, city government, we're going to start um, looking at the 2013 budget here very soon. I would imagine that that will be one of the things that we're talking about during 2013 budgeting cycle, <coughs> that we're going to have to, you know, do something about it or, or officially back off. But right now, I think we're still, it's still in play, and it's certainly something we're going to think about. Um, there's some people really excited about it, so it could be a cool thing. It really could. Other thoughts, comments? Questions? Go ahead. Oh, um, what are the next steps with the event center? I know that obviously mm -hmm. we voted on it and uh, it's going to happen. From the city council standpoint, are we getting into financing? Are there zoning issues? What What's next mm -hmm. for you? I know the, the financing piece of it changed quite a bit from when we were first talking about doing this and to now. So how does that work? That's an interesting question, and it's kind of a moving target at this point with the, with the event center. Um, we're hearing from the mayor's team that there is big interest in buying those naming rights, that there are companies out there that are really interested in buying those naming rights. So what that does then is it skews the conversation that we have about the bonds. Are they going to be, how many of those bonds are going to be tax free, and how many of them are going to be taxable? And that formula is dependent on, you know, how much do you have for concessions and how much do you have in terms of naming rights. And so that's kind of where we're at with, with that issue is that, that they're still determining that. But it's my understanding that we're going to sell those bonds. Um, you know, it originally it was January, and, and it's been kind of moved around, but it's partly because of that conversation. We'll be selling those bonds in the next month or so. You know, again, this is early March, so I would imagine we're going to be selling those bonds early in April. Um, you're going to see that it'll be a public sale. Um, you know, folks are going to be, if, you, if, if people want to buy those bonds, they can be involved through their broker to, to be part of, part of that project. But from a city council aspect then, what we're going to start seeing is some of the contracting will start coming through. You know, there was an open house a couple of weeks ago for the folks that um, are interested in being the subcontractors on that project and big interest. I think it's going to be interesting to watch this project and how local you know, local contractors are going to be involved with it. Um, so we'll start seeing those um, contracts come through. Um, you know, it is a, des a design build project, so they'll start, 
they can start digging before they know what the roof is going to look like. You know, so you'll see that process and we'll see coming through. It's one of those exciting things that, that the council did in the last couple of years is to bring back that, um, the idea of putting contracts on the agenda so that every Monday night we're looking at contracts and we're voting on those. And so we're going to see every one of those, every brick, every you know, whatever that goes into that event center, you're going to see those contracts on our agenda. So that's, that's the next piece. Is we'll start seeing that stuff roll. So it, it, is, in terms of the design, is that still fairly flexible? Does the contractor know? So I guess one question I had raised before we voted on this is whether this building would be LEED certified because I think if we're putting all this city money into an investment, um, want to make sure that we're being environmentally responsible. It is going to cost a little more to do that, but I think if it's going to happen, we should do it right the first time. And what are your thoughts on that? I, I, I agree. Then, then I take it one step further. And um, I was involved with the design process for the new West Side Library. And which, you know, very microcosm of the event center. But we talked a lot about LEED certification for that project and that added expense for getting the piece of paper as opposed to let's, you know, let's use the checklist. Yeah, we want it to, we want the water to do this and we want the, the parking lot to be, you know, this and all those sorts of things that all fit that checklist. But then do we also have to put down the 50 or 100 grand to get the piece of paper that says it's LEED certified. Welcome. We're just pretty laid back this morning. Come on in. <laughs> so um, absolutely. I think we're going to be looking at that, that you know, it's a huge roof area. Where is that stormwater going to go? You know, we absolutely better be thinking about rain gardens. We better be thinking about you know, making sure that isn't, we don't have runoff into those parking lots. We're not creating more flooding issues. All those sorts of things are going to be involved. There is a design committee. And thank God I'm not on it because I, you know, I can barely pick paint colors. But there is a design committee that involves, you know, local contractors in terms of architects and artists and all those sorts of folks are being involved with that. And so, I, you know, I don't know in terms of we always saw in the event center presentations how that building was sort of going to look. I think that's going to be pretty close because it was designed, you know, to be the 12,000 seats and, and to turn into a rodeo and turn into a wrestling and whatever else. I think it'll be very similar, but I think you're going to see that it's going to be flexible as we go through those design stages. Yeah. Um, the sites, the study of the site was completed over a month ago, and I had anticipated that when the mayor did his update uh, in February uh, that he would talk about that, mm -hmm. and he never even mentioned it. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any information no. on the site study? I don't right now, and I'm hoping because we do, we're, we're getting those updates every month and we're kind of debating, you know, gosh, do we need any more information about this project? But we do, because that's one of those key questions is how much rock is down there? How much blasting are we going to have to do? I mean, we saw it with, um, with the, the Drake Springs pool, how much blasting we had to do in order to get a swimming pool into that area. What, you know, that's going to make a huge difference in terms of the event center costs. So yeah, absolutely. I would expect that that's going to be part of that um, that next update, which is coming just in a couple of weeks here on the second second Monday in March. So we will be. It's absolutely top of the list. What what are we looking at now? Because Jesse's question is right on. What's the next step? Well, that's one of them. What are the issues we're hitting in terms of rock? What are, are we? Do we have you know environmental issues in that location? We need to know those things, and those are, those are the things that are that are part of that process at this point. Other questions, uh, comments? Yeah. Well, that'll all impact the co final cost of the project. I mean, if if I mean, isn't this kind of putting the cart ahead of the horse? I mean, they already now they mm -hmm. they haven't here's done the an impact study yet to find out what's going to cost to yeah. to, to, to start here's building. The, here's the thing about it, though. It's because it was that we did that use the contractor at risk at risk system. That contractor, when we hired. Um, the, the contractor that's going to oversee the whole project, they said it's going to cost $115 million. End of conversation, $115 million. Of course, we're going to finance it, and our cost will actually be more than that. But the actual cost of the building construction is not going to be more than $115 million. Now, if we end up spending more on blasting because we didn't know there was that much rock there, or we get to a point where we decide we need you know double the number of, of bathroom facilities we originally thought, whatever, 
that then is the trade-off later on in, okay, maybe we're not spending that much on carpet or instead of carpet we're doing linoleum or we aren't going to do as fancy, uh, you know, curtains or whatever. That's when that process starts to, the give and take is more toward the finishing side of it. But you're going to see that our understanding as citizens was, and that's what the ballot said, $115 million tops. And we're going to hold them to it. I mean, as citizens and as a city council, we're going to hold them to it. You know, obviously citizens... So we could come up with an $8,000 arena like we got. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, no. <laughs> because, of course, and here we are, you know, the Summit League tournament starts here in just a couple hours. And, and, and you know, folks are coming in even into that tin can that we call the, the arena. And God bless them. They run a great show out there. But with the facilities that they've got to do it with, my goodness... But, uh, yeah, absolutely. There will be some give and take, but it's going to turn out to be a nice facility or we're not. I mean, maybe some of that give and take is we need to sell some more naming rights for making sure that it turns out right, you know. Well, that's another question that brought up. Uh, do they have to sell the naming rights before the bonds are let? If, if the naming, the m amount of money for naming rights affects whether it's a tax-free or not tax-free bond, how do they know that before all the money is collected for the naming rights? Now we're into the magic part of the event center construction. I can't answer that for you. That part that's that's in that financing piece that we're gonna we'll see the end result of it, but we're not privy at this point to those negotiations and how that's going to come together. Um, you know, the mayor in his he does provide these monthly reports and he's always open to give him a call and ask him a question. But that's one of those things that is still in that negotiation phase, and we'll see it come out the other side. Other questions? How about new folks that are here? Is this a hypothetical question on the, st on the rock, the granite, or the bedrock that's in that area? Or you is know, this a fact? The question that Cheryl asked a minute ago was, um, do we have the report yet? Because they did the borings and all of that. And we haven't, as a city council, seen the borings yet, or seen that report on the, on the underground. Um, so yeah, it is kind of hypothetical in terms of yeah, what if there's more there than we thought? And then, so what happens to the cost? It is kind of, known that there is bedrock. Yeah, yeah. Well, we all know that there's outcroppings along in that area. Right, right, exactly. And, I, and, and obviously, when, you're, when you are estimating a cost for something of this size, you're going to assume that there's a ton of rock under there and we're going to have to do something with it. So, you know, we understand that's part of the process, but, it, but our hypothetical then is if there's more rock there than they thought, what does that do with the cost? And that's, that's our question for when the mayor does his updates, you know, in another week or so, we'll be asking those questions. Well, I'm hoping this contractor that, that uh, bid this is taking this into consideration and has added these costs in. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And again, that's that whole idea of contractor at risk. It doesn't say city at risk. It says contractor Correct. at risk. If he has messed up that estimate that bad, He's in trouble. He's bonded to mm -hmm. Absolutely. take that risk. He's t yeah. We, we're covered as a city. We're covered. That's why we went with that process. It's kind of, you know, it's a little different than, than uh, you know, what we're used to in sort of state bids where, every, you know, low bid is the winner every time and all those sorts of things. That's not how it works when we're talking about projects of this size. We really do not put the citizens at risk. We don't put the city at risk. We put the contractor at risk, and it works very well. I think we're going to be glad. In the end. But Michelle has spoken about the trade-off, and that is that you may end up with lesser of a building in the end because of unforeseen complications. Right. And we're just, we're, you know, I mean, I, I, I don't want to throw it out there like it's a dream. But we're hoping that they've got it all in there. But I think that these folks, you know, these, the folks that are the, our contractor at risk, were the contractor at risk for the target baseball field. And they did okay on that. They made big money doing that project. They're not going to put themselves at that kind of risk that they would that they would potentially lose. I think that we're in we're in, in safe territory using that process. Any other questions, thoughts, comments? Well, I do thank you for coming. I did. If if there are other questions, I'll certainly. But I'll pass it around again. But I just wanted to remind you that I did bring some of the just resource materials that I have as a city council member just for interest's sake. A lot of it's on the website, SiouxFalls.org, 
but uh, the current budget is there and some other things that I, that I use a lot. Um, and I would ask you, if you hadn't, if you would sign in. There's also comment cards there. If there's something we didn't cover today or if there are questions that may be um, for another uh, department of the city and you want to uh, add that information, uh, there are comment cards there for that, and I'd ask you to do that. Other questions before we wrap it up for the day? Oh, yeah. Um, I don't know if it got addressed earlier or not, but why is the city so bent on spending money on this downtown ice skating rink when we could spend this money in other places like bus routes and other? Good question. Good question. Um, there is no money in any budget that I've seen for a downtown ice skating rink, okay? Nothing has been approved. Um, it's not even it's not even been proposed. It is in the master plan for Falls Park. With my experience from the park board, in the master plan for Falls Park, there is an ice skating rink in that master plan. But that master plan is a 10-year plan, and it is funded in that particular master plan with private funds. It is not funded with sales tax dollars or local dollars in any way. So the dream, the 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 idea of perhaps a downtown ice skating rink is really just that. It's just a dream or an idea. I, we, we, no one is going to spend that kind of money without city council approval. And that's the important piece that you have to understand is that, you know, the administration can do these, you know, propose these ideas, have these dreams. That's great. That's how we grow. That's how we progress. But everything comes down to, when it comes to money, when it comes to policy, it comes down to the city council. And, you know, that's why I brought that budget is we spend a lot of time on that thing. We go line by line through that thing. And if an ice rink or whatever it is shows up that doesn't meet the test, it's out. You know, if we hear from folks and that, again, we talked earlier about that idea of citizen participation in government, this is it, man. When you're local city government, this is citizen participation at its best. I get phone calls. I get emails. I run into people in the grocery store who are saying to me things like, Again, the ice rink, that's a stupid idea, or whatever their, whatever their comments are. Absolutely, we're taking that. We're listening to citizens all the time. And so, I, you know, I take that, and I take that to heart, that, that that's a huge deal. I can't imagine where it would be if it were just downtown, but I can imagine it in Falls Park as part of the opportunities that are available there. And I would love to sell that idea to a Wells Fargo or a poet or whoever, who wants to fork over the cash so we'd have that amenity to add to our entertainment menu in downtown Sioux Falls. But right now, it's not going anywhere. We're not seeing it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think I think that's an honest characterization. You know, I mean, we we run into that kind of stuff with with anything. You know, you look at street projects or whatever. They, it's always great news if it comes in under budget. You know, because it it's hard to guess that kind of stuff. And what they ran into with phase one on the River Greenway is again, we, we talked about rock out, outcroppings all over this part of Sioux Falls. They ran into rock they had no idea was there. They had bored and done all their due diligence. But the boring had gone here, and the rock was here, you know, and they needed to build on that. That's where the cost overruns came there. That's, and, and, you know, absolutely, it's, it's something that we have to pay attention to. Um, from a city council perspective, then, I look at how are you managing those cost overruns. You know, if, 
if we're squeaking, an out, squeaking them out of somewhere else or we're trading off you know, production or, or, or uh, building on something else or whatever it is, let's be smart about how we're balancing that out. Um, especially when it's something that, and again, downtown and central district near and dear to my heart, I'm gonna, I struggle to say, no, don't do that because it's costing more. Let's, I'm much more willing to listen to, show me a compromise. Let's figure out how to make it work or how to do some of it now and some of it later. You know, let's, let's figure out how to be smart about this. But that project in particular is really exciting for downtown. It's going to attract, I mean, I don't think the Hilton Garden Inn would be looking at it if we weren't doing that kind of stuff outside. Um, so to me, it's a huge investment, and the return on that investment is dramatic. And so common sense for me. Part of what I disagree with, though, is that um, $1.9 is being used on the east and west bank of the river. I believe the intent of that lawsuit was to improve the quality of the river. Mm -hmm. And we all know that there's a lot of work to be done there. Mm -hmm. uh, now that money has been tied up on the east and west bank. Mm -hmm. Yep, exactly, and we're going to disagree on that one because I, I, I do think one of the big issues with, and, and we all know that the Big Sioux River is one of those endangered rivers in the country. You know, it's on the list. It's endangered, and it's, a big part of that is, you know, what's north of us, what's upstream is, you know, the cattle that are feeding right up next to it, and, and it's our water supply. But then the other piece of that is, and the reason that the morales money worked for me was that idea that it's the, the silting and the um, damage to the riverbank within the, city, within the city limits that was also adding to the issues with the river. And so for me, that worked to, to uh, use that morales settlement money. To, that really, to me, is an improvement. And yeah, it turns out to be beautiful in the end, and we use it for entertainment. That, to me, is, is the perk. It's the gravy on that particular one. But, but I hear what you're saying. I know that, that it was very specific. But I also understand that, that the federal judge that agreed to allow it to happen and the communities downstream from us agreed with that as well. It wasn't just us saying, yeah, we're taking that money. It's, it really has been a pretty big group effort to make that happen. But yeah, the Big Sioux River is a huge issue for us in Sioux Falls. I think you know, you're going to see us looking... Um, even more carefully at how do we improve that. One of the things that we very often see um, is we're doing, the city is doing work up, upstream on bank stabilization for that exact same reason, is that we've got to keep you know, the cattle and the feedlots back from that water source for us. And so we, as a city, we're putting money into property that's not even a lot of it in the city limits because of that critical water source. And so all kinds of issues with that. Yeah. We as a city now, are we done dumping raw sewage into the river? Oh, God, I hope so. I hope so. You know, um, they, don't, they don't call it the big poo for nothing, you know. It's been, it's been awful. It has been a horrible situation to be in. And it's one of those situations that, you know, we, I hate to complain about the people that came before us, but the lack of planning and the lack of maintenance on our main sewer lines has been deplorable. It's an embarrassment to us as a community to have allowed our infrastructure to degrade to that point and to allow our community to grow to the point that it has without the infrastructure keeping up. There is no good in that. There is nothing right about that. And so I'm excited that you know, that central Maine, we, we redoubled the efforts. That, that thing is going to be done more quickly than it ever would have prior, prior to. The Tuthill lift station has been rebuilt. You know, its capacity is dramatically higher than what it was before. And then we got the announcement this week that, and this is huge for the central district, in that um, the South Sioux in interceptor project, which will, it's going to tear up, you know, Phillips Avenue and parts of Minnesota and all kinds of stuff down in that south part right next to 29, but it's going to deal with those issues of the sewer backups that we've had. My neighbors on Pam Road have had their, their basements filled with sludge. You know, that's that too. You know, not only are we dumping muck into the river, we're dumping it into our neighbors' basements. This project, the South Sioux Interceptor Project, is going to be huge in terms of flooding issues in that, especially that area if you're driving Phillips Avenue, it starts to drop down in the 30s, you know, that area. 
and then go over the bump again and not down on the Pam Road and down along 29. Huge change in our lives down there in terms of you know that sewer issue and flooding issues. So for me, yeah, we're absolutely, we, we need to make that promise to ourselves and to our neighbors that we're not doing that again. But it took millions and a lot of you know a lot of work and making it move really fast, you know, on the part of the city, on the part of the city council, we had to approve some pretty big outlays of cash to make that happen. That was worth it. Those are the kinds of investments that are worth it. And there's you know that's I keep talking about the the effect that city government has on our daily lives. That's huge. You know, it's not glamorous, it's not glitzy, but it's a huge impact on our daily lives. So yeah, absolutely. Other comments, questions? I have one. Yeah. Um, can you give us your thoughts on the tug of war between the mayor and the council on contract approval? <laughs> yeah, I can actually. Um, the contract appro approval piece, um, it, t just to bring you up to speed, in October last year, council finally gave its approval to um, rewriting the ordinance that puts. Um, all of the contracts that that the city enters into over a certain amount, over twenty-five and fifty thousand, depending on what the contract is for, put them on our agenda every Monday. And so, and for the most part, you see, if you watch our meetings, we don't even we don't um, look at them individually. We look at them on our consent agenda. It's one vote, and and they're passed. But it is written. It's state law, and it's done in every other community in South Dakota and most cities around the country. The city council or the municipal board, whatever that process is for that community, approves those contracts. So council members prior to my service had started writing that, rewriting that ordinance and it passed finally in October. We had heard at one point that the mayor was going to veto that, but we knew that, you know, you, in government you kind of do those strategizing and you talk behind, you know, you call people and say, so are you going to vote and that kind of stuff. We knew that we had the votes to override a veto if it was going to veto. Um, what's happening now is we'll look um, this week, fiscal committee is going to kind of review that. We've been doing it for six months now. We have these contracts on the agenda. And um, I, we're, get, we're hearing a little bit of pushback from the administration, but I have to applaud city staff. for The finance folks and um, the pe people in purchasing have done an amazing job of making that stuff happen very quickly. Um, they really did, you know, kind of buckle down and say, okay, this is the law. The city council has passed this law. We're going to follow this law, and they've done a great job of it. You're going to see us this week at fiscal committee. We're going to pull it apart a little bit, and there will be a couple of tweaks to it probably. And then the other piece of it for us is going to be changing it because the council meets on Mondays. And this year is a really great example. There are many fifth Mondays in um, 2012, and the fifth Monday always throws our meeting schedule off. We don't meet on the fifth Monday, and now with the contract thing, it ends up stretching out the time. So we have also rewritten that ordinance requiring us to meet on Mondays and we would move it to Tuesdays and that would change a lot of things in terms of that contract um, approval process. And so yes, you've seen you know, publicly that we've kind of been battling the mayor on that, but I think that this, this system is working the way it is and we'll move to Tuesdays, that'll help. You know, um, I, it would be my hope that it would remain tabled. Um, that's one of those things, again, that, that um, individual council members met with individual members of the Charter Commission and just said, you know, clearly you haven't been watching. You haven't paid attention to the history and how important this has been to us. I mean, that process started bringing those contracts back to the power of the council. That process started in, in the issues that happened with the Phillips to the Falls project the Pasley Park overpass project, those sorts of things created issues that the council didn't have control over because council didn't have control over contracts. There were some huge issues there and the idea was to correct that and to take back the power that is already given to the council in terms of approving contracts. Um, so that was the conversation we had with, with uh, various members of the Charter Commission. We said, you know what? You're going down a dangerous road. You know, we really as citizens you know, collectively, as a council, obviously, but as citizens collectively, we need to have that view and that approval of every single con contract that crosses that crosses the mayor's desk. 
We absolutely, as citizens, have to have that. Well, and as a citizen, I watched this conversation go on for over a year with the council, um, you know, before the vote was actually taken. Um, it wasn't something that happened overnight. Uh, it was a long discussion. Yep. Yep. Um, I heard somebody say the other day that um, council doesn't, doesn't do much legislatively. They don't bring legislation, and I'm like, where have you been for the last year and a half? We've been working pretty dang hard, you know, on that particular issue in, in, in specific. But, well, thanks so much for your questions. I'll hang around for a few minutes after. And, um, again, there's a big pile of cookies there that still need to be eaten. So, you know, uh, again, thanks for coming, and I appreciate you hanging out with me with the Central District. I appreciate, appreciate that you're interested in these issues.